<laughs> Yo, what's up, people? This episode, we're going to be talking about asymmetric encryption, which is where you actually have two keys, a public key and then a private key, which I'm going to keep for myself. Pluralsight, it's one of the first learning platforms I used as a software developer. You can get a completely free trial and start learning by following a path on pretty much anything. The learning paths combine numerous courses giving you the step-by-step -step path to reach your goals. Or you can find individual courses on pretty much anything. Maybe you want a class on cryptography, security, Python programming, networking, maybe Java, you name it and they probably have it. I can genuinely say that Pluralsight helped me advance my skills and my career. I'll leave a referral link in the description, go check it out. So we talked about symmetric encryption in the previous episode and in that situation you only have one key and basically you would use this key to encrypt a message and then you would use the same key to decrypt a message and by key I'm not talking about a physical key we're talking about a sequence of bits ones and zeros that would be like 256 characters long or 128 characters long very very hard to guess but very very easy to use similar in nature to how physical keys work because you can take this key and you can open a door with it but if you have a lock and you don't have the key, it's very hard to open the lock. So lock picking is very similar to trying to guess a key or try to, trying to crack an encryption algorithm. It's very difficult to do, but it has been done and it can happen. But the more complex the key, the harder it is. If you know anything about lock picking, there's different levels on this key which are at different heights. And the combination of all these different heights is what allows the lock to turn once everything is aligned. If you doubled the length of the key, lock picking is going to be a lot harder. <laughs> um, it does, it's not a perfect correlation to keys inside of cryptography, but it's, it's a very similar concept of how they work. So this photo represents symmetric encryption, what we talked about in the previous episode. In that situation, there's only one key which is used to encrypt and decrypt. Now this here is a representation of asymmetric encryption where now you can use this public key to encrypt anything but the only person who can read it is in this situation it would be Elise who has the private key. So public keys are used to encrypt and then private keys are used to decrypt. This has the obvious benefit of me not having to give out my private key to other people. With symmetric encryption, if I wanted to send you a message, I would basically give you my key and I would have the key myself, I would encrypt it, and then you would decrypt it with that key. But if we use asymmetric encryption, I can encrypt a message using your public key and then you can decrypt it using your private key. Then if you wanna to respond to me, you can encrypt a message using my public key and I can decrypt it with my private key. So the only person who has the private key is the receiver. We don't have to be giving out our keys to anybody. The public key is fine to give out because, well, for one, the title public key kind of gives that impression. I mean, that's not always the case. You don't always want to give out your public key, but in, in the most situations, it's fine to give out your public key because it can be used to encrypt, but it can't be used to decrypt. If someone encrypts a message with my public key, that message is useless except for me who has the private key. So it's just an added layer of complexity, but I think ultimately it is a better solution. This is how things work with NordLocker, which again, I'll leave a link for you guys in the description. In this situation, a file is encrypted using a public key, but the only way you can decrypt that is to use the secret key to get that original file. Now, I've been using private key, but secret key is also an adequate name for that secret, private, same thing. Now, one of the most popular forms of asymmetric encryption is the RSA algorithm. Now, I also wanted to mention, if I didn't make this clear, asymmetric encryption is also often known as public key encryption. So you'll hear asymmetric and you'll also hear public key encryption. Either one is fine. You might see this algorithm used with SSL. So for example, if you go to a website, such as this piece of crap right here, you can hit this lock at the top and go to certificate and then details. Scroll down just a little bit. You'll see some stuff about 
the public key info and you'll see RSA encryption right there. So you can get into more of web browser encryption. There's all kinds of stuff on that, but just know that this is a popular algorithm and it's, it's important to know about. Now, one of the known downsides of public key encryption is that it's rather slow. And as a result, there will sometimes be a switch from the asymmetric encryption to the symmetric with just one private key. And this actually fixes a problem we talked about in the, the previous episode where I was explaining about if we just had a private key, how can I share this key info with you without any other person intercepting that information? And I don't wanna to have to meet you in person and write down my key or anything like that. Well, we can actually use public key encryption to effectively send that private key secretly to the other person. An example of this is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is essentially a protocol of how to give a private key to somebody else without it being snatched by anybody in the process. So we start with asymmetric encryption, which will allow me to deliver this private key to you, which we will then use for subsequent messages using symmetric encryption. Now, if you wanna see this in practice, you can find this article uh, IBM has on the SSL or uh, the TLS handshake, which basically goes through this process of how these things exchange keys and how they start communicating with each other securely. You can see it right here. We use asymmetric encryption techniques to generate a shared secret key. We then use that shared key for symmetric encryption of messages, which is faster than asymmetric encryption. So that described that same exact process. So it's not always one or the other, it's more of a hybrid approach. And if you want to know more, you can research hybrid crypto systems on Wikipedia or, or Google to get more uh, steps on how that works. So up to this point in this series, you should understand that for symmetric encryption, we have one private key, which is used to encrypt and decrypt. And then for asymmetric encryption, we use a public key to encrypt and then a private key to decrypt. You should also know the two encryption algorithms we've talked about, which is AES for symmetric encryption and then RSA for asymmetric or public key encryption. Next up, we're going to touch on something known as elliptic curve cryptography. We'll just scratch the surface with it, but I, it is a thing and you should probably know about it. So we'll talk about that next. Thank you guys.